You're listening to the audiobook of Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, written by Federico Pistono, read by Ian R. Buck. Find the show notes for this chapter at thenexus.tv slash rsj1. Chapter 1. Unemployment Today. We usually get a sense of how good or how bad things are by reading the news and by looking at the world around us. We see how we live, we talk to our neighbors, we read newspapers, blogs, tweets, and watch TV. Very few people find the time to check for themselves the long and boring tables from the OECD Factbook or the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. The business columns in newspapers are often filled with financial jargon, which does not really encourage a clear understanding to those who are not familiar with the intricacies of the economic system. As a result, most people do not have a clue about what is really going on. A quick glance at the recent statistics about job growth in the United States and in Europe should make us a bit concerned, to say the least. In July 2011, the U.S. government released a report showing that 117,000 new jobs had been created that month, and the New York Times featured a promising headline, U.S. posts stronger solid growth in July. Reference 1. But an ugly truth was hidden behind this veil of false hope. A growth of 117,000 jobs was not even enough to make up for the population growth, about 130,000 people every month let alone to make a dent in the 12.3 million jobs lost during the 2008-2009 to recession. Later in the article, we discover a few more things. The official figure for the unemployment rate was 9.1%, which is already staggeringly high, but it gets even more concerning when considering that an additional 8.4 million people were working part-time because they could not find a full-time job, and 1.1 million had become so discouraged that they had stopped looking for work altogether. If we include these people, the broader measure of unemployment was 16.1% in July 2011. Please take a moment and let that sink in. The United States of America, possibly the wealthiest country in the world, had an unemployment rate at 16.1% as recent as July 2011. As if that was not enough, it turns out that only 58.1% of the population was working, the lowest level in nearly three decades, reference two. Laura DeAndrea Tyson, professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley, calculated that even if we could somehow create 208,000 new jobs per month, every month, for the foreseeable future, it would still take until 2023 to fill that gap. Reference 3. In January 2012, thanks to massive efforts from both the private sector and the government, the unemployment rate fell to 8.3%. Reference 4. A very mild consolation, considering that people employed part-time for economic reasons, marginally attached to the labor force, discouraged workers, and the long-term unemployed changed very little over the year. To make things even worse, the labor force participation rate is 63.7%, its all-time lowest since 1983, when women had not entered the workforce in large numbers, and it is dropping consistently every year. Reference 5. MIT economists Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee make a lucid analysis of this problem in their book Race Against the Machine, How the Digital Revolution is Accelerating Innovation, Driving Productivity, and Irreversibly Transforming Employment and the Economy, reference 6, which deals with the current unemployment crisis and tries to offer some solutions, particularly by reforming education, the system of economic incentives, and by promoting entrepreneurship. While I concur with their analysis, I think their solutions are limited to the way things have worked until now. They appear to be assuming that the system of economic incentives, what drives people, and human nature itself are almost immutable. According to Voltaire, work spares us from three evils, boredom, vice, and need, and having a job has undoubtedly been the driving force to combat them up until now. However, I challenge the assumption that this is the only way we can do that, and we shall explore why in the coming chapters. Other authors have addressed the same issue. Jeremy Rifkin was one of the first to seriously consider this problem. In 1995, he published The End of Work, The Decline of the Global Labor Force, and The Dawn of the Post-Market Era, Reference 7, 
where he predicted that worldwide unemployment would increase as information technology eliminates tens of millions of jobs in the manufacturing, agricultural, and service sectors. He traced the devastating impact of automation on blue-collar, retail, and wholesale employees. While a small elite of corporate managers and knowledge workers reap the benefits of the high-tech world economy, the American middle class continues to shrink and the workplace becomes ever more stressful. Reference 8. While he may have gotten some of the details wrong, the general outline is so spot-on that it seems almost prophetic. Over the past 20 years, we have witnessed the gradual disappearance of the American middle class with rising costs and lower income. References 9 and 10. While the wealthiest Americans have accumulated more wealth than ever before in history. To get an idea of the disproportionate amount of wealth generated by the system, how unevenly distributed it is, and exactly how it had steadily become worse since 1979, let us look at the following graphs. Reference 11. As you can see from figure 1.1, average household income had remained pretty much the same for well over 80% of the population, while the top 1% experienced a tremendous increase, particularly starting in 1994. Even more revealing is the change in share of income calculated after taxes. Figure 1.2. Change in share of income, 1979 to 2007, calculated after taxes. The lower 80% have actually seen a substantial decrease of income, while the very top has hardly been affected. What is even more worrying is the distortion in the public perception of this phenomenon, even after the worldwide Occupy movement broke out. A 2011 paper by Harvard professor Michael Norton and Duke University professor Dan Ariely called Building a Better America, One Wealth Quintile at a Time, shows just how skewed our perception is. Reference 12. Figure 1.3. A Harvard business professor and a behavioral economist recently asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth is distributed in the United States. Most thought that it's more balanced than it actually is. Asked to choose their ideal distribution of wealth, 92% picked one that is even more equitable. History proved Rifkin right. The middle class is disappearing, the richest are getting richer, and we have no idea how bad the situation truly is. The question is, was Rifkin right about work and automation too? Martin Ford followed up on this, utilizing his entrepreneurial and software engineering perspective. His 2009 book, The Lights in the Tunnel, Automation, Accelerating Technology, and the Economy of the Future aims to show how automation will inevitably lead to structural unemployment and millions of people, both skilled and unskilled workers, will soon find themselves out of the workforce with little to no chance of getting back in. Ford has since written many articles on major news websites, thereby bringing the issue of technological unemployment back into the public eye. He was also a source of inspiration to me when I decided to write this book. However, as with Brynjolfsson's book, I do not think his solutions are feasible, nor in most cases desirable. All of these authors have identified a real problem, and they've tried to propose viable solutions to that problem using their knowledge, skills, analysis, and background. But as I read their books, I felt there was something missing. Something was not accounted for. I felt they were trying to find solutions in a context where solutions were nowhere to be found. Before I continue, let us be clear on something. All of the authors I just mentioned are highly qualified and intelligent professionals, with much more academic and working experience than myself. That is not in question. But they were not born into a culture where things changed dramatically in just a few years. They had to adapt to the idea of rapid change. They were not born in a generation that created this massive accelerating change. I was lucky enough to be part of that generation. I have seen the free and open source movement rise and become one of the greatest forces on the planet. The dreams I had when I was a child of small groups of dedicated and intelligent people changing the world have come true. It has been exhilarating to witness these events, which are becoming even more ubiquitous, as their rampant increase terrifies the establishment and excites the revolutionaries. Perhaps I am wrong, and all of this comes from my arrogant, blissful ignorance of youth. But perhaps there is something true that transcends me as an individual and speaks through me. It is the collective intelligence of all the people I have spoken with, all the books I have read, the experiences I've had in the ever-connected cybernetic organism known as the Internet. I do not pretend to be the voice of my generation, or that of the entire web for that matter. 
but it is undeniable that these intelligences have shaped me, influenced me, and directed me over the years. And now I am simply remixing what I received. This is social evolution. Copy, transform, and combine. Reference 13. However, there is also another possibility. It is entirely conceivable that we are all wrong, myself and those authors. Mainstream economists and analysts could be right. It may be that we do not understand some basic economic concepts and that our analyses are nothing more than a fallacy, which could be easily solved by getting our economics right and by studying the past a little bit more. After all, we have seen unemployment fluctuate up and down for hundreds of years, only to go back to familiar levels, without any substantial change in the structure of the economy. As new technologies come along, we cyclically move from one sector to another, creating new jobs, and everything works just fine. Economists have a name for this phenomenon, which takes us back a long time. So, before I go any further, let me tell you a story. You have been listening to the audiobook of Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, written by Federico Pistono, read by Ian R. Buck. This audiobook is a production of The Nexus TV, a network of technology-focused podcasts. Find our other shows at thenexus.tv. This audiobook is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License, so feel free to use any part of it as long as you link back to the original page. You do not use this for any commercial purposes, and you release your version under the same license. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. We're presented with so many choices in our lives. How do we make sure we're making sound decisions? By getting a second opinion from an informed source, of course. Lucky for you, the hosts from across the Nexus use lots of hardware, software, and media and analyze them on our show, Second Opinion. From reviewing the latest phones and laptops to pitting apps against each other, we've got you covered. Find us on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for Second Opinion Reviews in your favorite podcast player.